just use the arrow keys to advance the slide. Okay, and can I point like this? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and here, I got out of your hair. All right. And you can go ahead and uh, start whenever you want. Okay. No, I just make one. I can't see the. I won't be. Oh, that's me. Yeah, that I won't be able to see the other students. That doesn't matter. They don't zoom. They don't okay. like. It's not a live. Okay. Um, okay. So if they're going like this and asking questions, I won't know necessarily. It's, okay. It's, it's asynchronous. Okay. For the online okay. Okay. Good. Okay. Well, thanks everybody for coming. Um, I am Melissa, and I was recently um, recruited to this institution about a year ago. I am an expert in studying human brain chemistry, so I'm going to show you how I do that. Um, and I uh, study it nowadays. I use this to study aging and Alzheimer's disease. My my claim to fame, my claim to fame, is really being able to measure very small signals that are highly overlapped in the NMR spectrum, and um, being able to use those to study disease. So the outline of my talk today, the, the, by the title, I'm going to tell you about my work in non-invasively measured human brain biochemistry and aging in Alzheimer's and disease. But I'm also going to tell you, because you're a neuroscience group, about um, Human Connectome Project on Aging and Default Mode Network Biochemistry. So this is a project that I became part of just because I had um, expertise studying people who are aging. And I think you'll find that um, perhaps more easy to grasp onto, maybe more interesting or enticing, um, because in the end, of course, we hope you'll stay interested in neuroscience and perhaps want to join one of our labs and help us with the work that we have to do day to day in these projects. So um, probably or hopefully everybody's had a chance to see what a chemistry room um, NMR scanner looks like. That's what this picture is of. So basically what it is is you um, put a test tube into this scanner, you drop it in the top, and it's a very high, highly homogeneous magnetic field, and you're able to get spectra of what, chemi what chemicals look like. So um, how, no, that's not what I, I, I told you. I do um, human brain biochemistry. So a lot of people really find it hard to grasp the concept that I'm actually measuring this kind of chemistry but in the living human brain. So in order to convert this kind of um, spectrometer into a human brain scanner, you just have to tip it over, stretch it a little, and now you have a human MRI machine. And of course, I'm greatly oversimplifying, but I do want you to understand that um, this really is just simply taking chemical spectra of the living human brain. So I'm not talking about cell systems or proteomic studies or um, even like uh, shining a light through the skin or something, we, this is, or doing, um, s inserting any kind of electrode or probe. This is just simply putting, this is the MRI scanner, and these measurements are done by putting a person into an MRI machine. And the MRI machine is by nature actually measuring spectra from water. That's how it gets its images. So we're just going to measure the spectra of all the smaller signals that are also in the brain, just like water. So here's what they look like. Um, what we do, this is uh, unfortunately somewhat of a poor image because it was acquired very quickly because imaging is not the purpose of my research. But this is a slice, this is an image of a slice through the head, so a sagittal slice. So you, my hand would be the slice that this is imaging and this is a taking a picture. So uh, this would be the person's nose in the back of their head. Um, and what we do is we look at a one cube of image in the br of tissue in the brain. So we always take a picture. We set up our scanner so it's focusing its measurement on just one cube or one position uh, in the brain, and then we measure this spectrum. So um, 
what we're able to see then is even though this doesn't look as intuitive as this, this is the information that we're actually going for. So you get a spectrum. Along this axis is what's called, um, we call it PPM, parts per million, which is actually quite nonspecific for you. It's a frequency, so molecules have really signatures of what they look like. They resonate at a certain frequency. So the bump on this line tells you what chemical it is. And uh, uh, the space, the, the, the location it is along this line tells you that this is the brain chemical and acetylspartate. It's um, thought to be a marker of neuronal health. How tall that is tells you how much of it is, how much of that signal is in the brain. So um, this is total creatine. It's thought to be a, m a marker of energy. And total cholines are um, a membrane marker. So, but you can see there's a lot of smaller bumps in here. And I've greatly oversimplified because these peaks are, um, when they're just coming from one single proton molecule, they're this nice sharp peak. But if, they come, if they're actually part of a molecule that's more complicated, um, they give lots of peaks for each, um, for each signal. So um, NAA also has other um, peaks out in this area. So it actually helps us when we try to um, tease apart exactly what's in there. <coughs> so this is, like I said, this is what I do. I do edited spectroscopy, which is uncovering tiny signals. And I was the first person to show with proton spectroscopy that we can measure signal from vitamin C in the living human brain. So this is similar to what I showed you in the last slide. So along this axis is frequency, and the location of these peaks along this line tells us what they are. And I told you this, I gave you a hint earlier that this is this NAA peak that I talked about. This, so it's in this same location. This, was, this spectrum here from NAA was measured from a bottle of water that had NAA in it, and that's how we know what it looks like. You can also do, um, simulations, mathematical simulations to get to know what these look like. But it, and I told you too that it has a few other peaks over here. That's what NAA looks like in a bottle of water. But these are, there are at least 14 chemicals contributing to this spectrum. And you can see that NAA is pretty easy to see with your eyes. You probably don't need special methods to pick that out. But this is the vitamin C signal. Vitamin C is also called ascorbate or ascorbic acid. It's an important antioxidant, and it has other functions that we're discovering. But look at how tiny the signal from it is compared to the NAA signal. And also, if you look down the line, these two bumps overlap with a whole bunch of other things. The w and so it's really hard to make someone believe that you can actually pick out this tiny little signal from inside of this mess. So um, when I first discovered the vitami vitamin C molecule, we did not do things this way. Instead, we have a, a special sequence or a, a special way that we do the measurement um, that we're able to see only the signals that we're looking for, at least to an extent. Um, it uses the chemical structure of the molecule, and you play certain tricks inside of the way that you measure the data so that you only measure a, a very small subset of the compounds that are in the sample. So in, this was edited for vitamin C. And with this editing sequence, now you can see that there's a lot fewer contributors. So these are the things that we expected might give signal to us compared to all 14 of these. And now you're more able to believe that this bump on this line comes from vitamin C. And so what I did in some of my, I'll show you some of my earliest exper experiments. I think part of the goal of this seminar is to kind of give you a little bit of uh, experience with what it's like to be a scientist or what it takes to do really basic level, discover something new, what happens in the field, and, and what, um, I do hope that, you know, it would be awesome if I discover the next molecule here in Missouri with one of you. So hopefully may maybe we can entice someone to do some of this kind of work. So um, what we did then was we compared the, um, what, what we're really going for is we, we know that this is vitamin C because it's been overly, sim it's been simplified. And we, I actually did, so I'll, I'll show you some experiments later um, that also get towards the validation of this. But um, we, we did a lot of experiments also with bottles of water. So you put vitamin C into a, a solution and you make sure it behaves the same, same way as what you're seeing in the human brain. We learned a lot of new things though because vitamin C oxidizes when you put it in the sample so you can't keep it from one day to the next. So we thought, what are we doing wrong? And it actually turned out that our sample had degraded. Um, lots of kind of fun moments in the lab when you were trying to be very theoretical and the problem was very simple. But so here what we did then, in order to prove 
that we can actually measure vitamin C in here without having to do this. This, is a, uh, a, this technique takes a long time and has some, confound, some confounding things that can happen just because of the way it's done. So we would rather do it this way. Plus, when we're studying human brain chemistry, we would, chemistry, we would rather see all of these things and not just a few things. So we need to convince the field that indeed we can see this tiny signal in here. So the first thing we did was we studied rat pups. We know that vitamin C concentration starts high and starts to go down as the rat brain, um, ne rat brain neuronal environment matures. So we knew that this was going to be a good model. Another thing is that um, I had a colleague who works very hard to get really good spectra in his rat pup studies, and he was having this problem. Um, he did it before I discovered vitamin C. He was trying to fit all of these peaks. Really what this is is a fit. This is a, like a, um, you give the model all of these basis spectra and it tells you what combination of all of these will make that spectrum. So here, what he, he, that's what he was doing here and he was doing that but he was always finding he's really, really fussy. Like usually your residual from your fit should be pretty just noise and there should be no peaks in it. But he was finding these tiny little bumps and he was wondering why am I still having these bumps that I can never get rid of? what's imperfect about my measurement technique. And then I discovered vitamin C and he said, oh, I think there's vitamin C in there and we're not fitting it. So this is one of the proofs that there's actually vitamin C in this spectrum is that when you do the fitting after you put vitamin C in, the residuals go away. But the other one is that we did, we did a series of, of rat pups where that we measured them when they were first born and as they got older and we measured their vitamin C levels and found that um, we had literature values and we had this, my editing spectroscopy was agreeing very well with the literature and we did find that um, even though the vitamin C levels are, are slightly lowered when measured with this technique, they still have the same pattern and they still follow the vitamin C decline. Um, and they actually have, you can actually see too that they have a lower error bar on them. So it is a higher, it, it, that also shows us that this is a better way to do it. It's gonna, it actually has more signal to noise for many reasons to measure vitamin C this way instead of with editing. I'm gonna look at my clock now and then because I added a whole segment on this on the imaging piece, the connect home imaging for you guys. So I wanna make sure I don't spend too long here. Just wanted to tell you another thing that I did just kind of give you a, a sense of how science works. So part of my training was in, um, in figuring out how to measure tiny, tiny molecule signals. And another, it just so happened that before I did vitamin C, I also measured glutathione. People are very interested in glutathione because it's one of the predominant um, antioxidants in the human brain. And I got to thinking, well, um, when we do editing, what we have to do is we, we have a trick inside of the scanner where we make a, manip a, a very specific manipulation on every other time we measure the signal. So we have what we call, we, this manipulation is on and then it's off and it's on and it's off. And only the, only the molecules that are part of this particular physical environment that we're optimizing for will stay when we subtract on minus off. And so you get all of the signals in all of the on scans, all of the off scans. They have all, all of these signals, but when you do the subtraction, you only get, you get just the one that you're looking for. And I got to thinking, well, we're kind of waste, if we really do want to see a specific compound, we're wasting that off time. We're really not doing anything special with it. But glutathione and, anti and vitamin C are both very important antioxidants in the central nervous system. So I decided instead of turning on, off, on, off, I turned on for ascorbate, on for glutathione, on for ascorbate, on for glutathione. And so there, therefore, within this world of editing, I was um, one of the few people to do editing for two things at the same time. Usually you're trying to do just one thing, and this was two very specific antioxidants. So I invented what's called the antioxidant profile, improved that you can edit for two things at the same time. And um, honestly, my early research career was more focused on glutathione. That's where my grant was. But because I could do both of them at the same time, um, I was able to actually learn things and realize that the vitamin C signal was going to be important in aging. So um, I think I'll skip this one. It's just another detail. And I, th I feel like I've spent time covering some of this kind of thing. So here's one of the experiments that I promised you. Uh, I told you that you know it's really hard to get people to believe 
that you can see that tiny, tiny little signal underneath all of the mess that it resides inside of. So one of the things I did to prove that this is that this method of fitting and, get and measuring this tiny chemical is robust is we did mathematical simulations. So we took five people and we put them in the scanner twice. So we had a way of testing um, re re reproducibility of the data set. But we also had variants, like not every human being is the same. And certainly the noise won't be the same. So we're not just measuring noise. But what we did was we took the spectra from, let's say, let's just focus on one person on one day of measurement. We took their spectrum, and mathematically, we took the spectrum that came from a bottle of water, and we added a little bit of signal from the, of glutathione, like we were trying to validate glutathione detection here. So we added a known amount of glutathione signal mathematically. Uh, one of the jokes I have, I've forgotten to tell you so far, one of the big differences that we have compared to a chemistry stockroom uh, or a chemistry NMR scanner is we cannot purify our samples. Um, human beings don't like to uh, go through any kind of process. And actually, they spin their samples. We also can't spin our samples. So we are not injecting glutathione into the human brain or adding real chemical. What we're doing is mathematically adding the signal that comes from it. But when we add that signal into the base one, then we can put that whole thing through the fitting again, and we can make sure that we're able to pick up the signal change that we imposed. So we were able to prove that there's a, a very nice one-to-one -one slope between the signal that we added and the signal that the model fit, even down to, quite surprisingly, when there's nothing in there, you don't fit anything. And I know that doesn't, you're, you're probably thinking, duh, of course that should happen. But actually, models can make up things that aren't there pretty easily. Um, even I've been learning more and more about AI, um, uh, artificial intelligence, that if you train a model to look for something, it will find it, possibly quite often, even if it's not there. So um, in our field also, this was an important thing to know, that not only can we measure you know, small changes, but we can actually still measure that compound when it's greatly depleted. Here's another interesting experiment along the same lines with glutathione. So. Um, this is a pharmacology study. N-acetylcysteine is a drug, and it was administered intravenously. So I'm um, trying to fill in some of the words on the slide here for you. So to make a long story short, my, my colleagues in pharmacology came to me and said, we have this drug. We think it changes oxidative status in the brain. We want to put our person in the magnet before and after we give the drug, and we want you to show us a change in brain chemistry. Well. I mean, one of the key things I'm sure everyone in the room, or, or if you don't know now, you will know very soon that the brain is under extremely tight homeostatic um, maintenance. The brain really doesn't let things in and out very easily at all, and it doesn't let anything change. And so I said to these colleagues, well, you know, the brain is under extreme homeostatic maintenance. You're never going to see a change like that. This is a tiny signal, you know. Uh, I, even if, the, even if the brain lets it happen, I don't know that, I don't think we're going to pick it up. But lo and behold, fortunately, I was wrong. And I'm really glad I did the study because it gave me another opportunity to, to prove that we can pick this up. So they gave the drug, and in every single person, this is the glutathione signal. So um, it's a long study, and they can pharmacologically measure when they think the brain will have its response to the drug, and they predicted that that would be about an hour. So the person can't lay in the magnet that long. Um, usually people can lay still for about an hour. So we gave, what we did was we gave the drug and then we let the person come back out of the magnet. So we did, it, we did this before, uh, we made this measurement before they got the drug, they came out of the magnet and got every, all their lines in and then they went in the magnet and um, we um, watched what happened to the drug over time. So you can see here that be, even before we put them in the magnet, the drug had already caused the chemistry in the brain to change. But we also picked up while this, they were in the magnet this whole hour. And you can see that the signal increased. And you know, um, some people then, uh, there are people in the field, actually glutathione is really a, a, it's kind of a hot topic. And a lot of people believe that this data, these data aren't true. But no one can tell me why. They just don't think that this can happen in the brain, kind of like I thought. But no one is really saying something's wrong with the data. So anyway, one, one critique, people said, said, well, maybe you're just measuring the, the drug in the blood. You're not really measuring a brain chemistry change. But um, so then we measured the redox ratio of this drug in the blood. And you can see that that peaked here. And so in the brain, it kept building up, even though it was washing out of the person's system. So um, that's kind of what we went through to prove that we really are seeing vitamin C in the living human brain. 
Then we did a study with it. So my goal um, in this whole research program is I'm interested in oxidative stress in aging and Alzheimer's disease. So I'm giving you some details about this method. And this is a, a brain picture. So this is, again, a slice like this through the brain. But this is up towards the nose. This toward the back of the head. And we measured the chemistry in these two brain regions. This is somewhat thought to be a control region. We don't really think that the occipital cortex ages or gets very impacted by Alzheimer's disease, but we do expect the posterior cingulate cortex to be impacted by Alzheimer's disease. So we took, these experiments are expensive, it's hard to recruit people, they take a long time. So we have small sample sizes and we always have to remember to think about cohort effects. But we had 16 young um, individuals, 19 to 22 year old. You might guess how we ended up with that age range given that we're on a university campus. So um, that's our, who our young cohort were. And then we had p patients with mild Alzheimer's disease. So I have neurologist and neuropsychologist collaborators in this project who see every patient. They look over um, about an hour or more worth of cognitive testing that's done by on the healthy side. And also um, they see the patient. They actually see the, the healthy controls and the patients to make sure they really have Alzheimer's disease. Really important just in the field of studying Alzheimer. Um, or studying any kind of disease, making sure you have your clinical. I'm not a physician. I have no medical school background. I'm a medical physicist. So heavily relying on my neurologist colleagues there to deal with this part. And then um, to make a long story short, this was a grant that had two aims to study aging and Alzheimer. And we discovered with my statistician colleagues that we could just combine the, the, con the older people from the aging study were the same experiment as the controls for the patient. So we have a, a bigger control group for both studies. It's just some things that we thought about. We, um, we actually gender matched in this study. And for inclusion criteria, um, we wanted to make sure that they weren't eating a huge amount of fruits and vegetables that we thought at the time that that could possibly confound the study. Uh, and so they're not taking a huge amount of antioxidant supplements and also smoking could potentially influence brain vitamin C levels. We know that it does in the blood. So unfortunately, um, well, I mean, fortunately for me, I had run into colleagues at conferences who were really interested in vitamin C and smoking and warned me to probably watch out for that in my studies. However, over time, I've actually done studies where we also intravenously infused human beings with large amounts of vitamin C. We saw no changes in their brain. So I'm quite sure that dietary influences are pretty minimal in the brain's vitamin C levels. Um, and also now I've accumulated at least this data set and we have not found any effect of smoking on brain vitamin C levels. So I don't worry about that in particular so much anymore. And, and if you're interested, this, all of the statistical analysis was done with mixed linear models and we had um, the statistician helped me design these experiments. We had five of the studies, I believe we had people come back two additional times. So we had three repeats in each study group um, to help manage test, retest, repeatability. So here's the results of that study. So in the blue boxes are this posterior cingulate cortex brain region. So that's the one that we thought would be impacted by Alzheimer's disease. In the red are the occipital cortex where we actually, really the literature had not reported very many changes with aging or Alzheimer's disease. We are able to pick them up because I haven't even bragged to you, I haven't bragged up yet our next gen 7 Tesla scanner, which is really the reason that I'm in Missouri. Um, so with the building of, of next gen imaging facility, um, one of the things they did was they bought a very, the 7 Tesla scanner and put it in the basement. You can't measure vitamin C like this without the 7 Tesla scanner. Uh, technology, you know, because we're doing it now, they're starting to maybe be able to catch up with lower field scanners, but this is a very special um, machine, uh, a human brain 7 Tesla MRI system. And so that's really what my um, research is based on. And I'm the director of the Next Gen Imaging Facility. They brought me here because the expertise on the instrument is needed. So we do lots of, well, lots of really interesting things with the 7 Tesla, but you know, there's a, maybe a half a dozen of them in the nation. And so it's a, it's a, it's a really um, great resource if you ever get a chance to get involved in possibly doing some work there. So anyway, we were able to pick up, so people don't usually measure vitamin C. That's, and so no wonder it wouldn't be in the literature because you can't see it until my work. But also usually people measure glutamate and glutamine. They're, um, they are excitatory inhibitory neurotransmitter pair, but here we're measuring them. These things are separated from one another. But the most interesting finding, to be honest with you, this, this had been in the literature. In Alzheimer's disease, in the posterior cingulate cortex, there are pretty robust signals in inositol, which is thought to be 
an inflammatory marker, a, a, an astroglial, or a, a marker of gliosis in the brain, and totalcholine is a membrane marker, and these were well known for a long time. But we actually had a higher vitamin C concentration in Alzheimer's disease participants. And that was a puzzler, because it's an antioxidant, and if I was really expecting to, if I were lucky, I would be able to measure a lower vitamin C concentration. And actually, you know, that's what we see in aging. So what do I think is happening there? So these, all of these things I told you a little bit about, you know, each chemical is thought to be associated with a process. But if I take my crude drawing of a neuron, what do I think is happening in this scenario? If we take the occipital cortex as an earlier stage of aging, when neurons start to get sick, I spent days in the library um, digging through old, old textbooks, talk really, really old history about why do neurons get sick. What causes neurons to die? Why do they die? And this is the best summary of the picture that I was able to put together. Um, we start with glutamate excitotoxicity, which I think is very interesting from the get-go. So if you have no interest in the physics side of things, I think this is really interesting. Um, I think it, it, if it's, I think a lot of what goes on with problems in the brain might have to do with overstimulation. So glutamate, they, the brain gets too much glutamate and it can't handle all that. And that could happen with stress, anything from stress to, um, um, Nar you know, c chronic narcotic exposure, something like this. I mean, we, we do hit our brains with a lot of stuff. So anyway, glutamate, um, glutamate, there's too much glutamate in the environment, and so you get too much calcium coming into the cells. The dendrites start to swell. The mitochondria start to have um, inefficient and unhealthy ways that they use sugar to make energy. And then you have all these bad things start to happen. The depolarization machinery of the neuron gets compromised. We talked about the energy. Um, you start to get all kinds of bad enzymes going on, and they actually start to destroy components of the cell. But you get free radical formation, and vitamin C starts to go down. So in aging, I really think at this stage, in the occipital cortex is probably aging younger. Like we're seeing a, an earlier picture of what's going on because that brain region wasn't really thought to be aging. So we're getting kind of a picture possibly of what's happening early. And then the why, why would vitamin C signal ever rise though? I couldn't really get a, too much thought of that except um, to remember that as you go farther and farther along, I mean this is maybe why the inositol signal is starting to go up in Alzheimer's disease. It's a glial marker so maybe now the neuron is starting to struggle and the glia are coming in to rescue. So maybe that's why we get more um, signal from that. But then we have to remember in Alzheimer's disease there's plaques. So this is a, my caricature of a plaque. And what I learned from much reading is that um, peripheral leukocytes, any kind of inflammatory cell, is actually very, very full of vitamin C. So, um, and it has been shown in the literature that peripheral leukocytes do get into the brain in Alzheimer's disease and co-localize with plaques. So it may be that actually we're not looking at the the base ascorbate concentration in the neurons, we're actually looking at different cells that are carrying it. Another thing that I think might be happening, happening is that chronically activated microglia could be recruited to the site, and I think this is, I don't know, I, I would love to have more time in my research program to chase down this hypothesis, but I think that most likely um, when a microglia gets activated for a long time, they are like the resident macrophages of the brain, because usually macrophages don't get through the blood-brain barrier. That's their job, so why wouldn't they also become like peripheral macrophages and get a lot of vitamin C in them when that becomes their job? So I'm thinking possibly it's the resident microglia that are accumulating ascorbate and causing the signal in Alzheimer's disease. And I'm gonna skip some of this um, because I really want to have time to show you the connectome. So, enfolding spectroscopy into the connectome. So I had uh, 20, 20, 25 years of experience doing this brain chemistry, and I had now taken my program to study aging um, and Alzheimer's disease. I had gotten a few grants, so I got used to, I mean, we haven't even talked about the practical sides of recruiting participants who are older, um, what are there so many things about um, designing a good experiment that respect age, because age impacts more than just the chemical concentrations. There are other things we have to consider. Um, other parameters do change in the brain when you get older. So I had the expertise on both of those things, so I had the opportunity in my 
lab to join the Human Connectome Project on Aging. So this is part of the BRAIN initiative. It's really a big deal at the NIH. Um, trying to mapping the Human Connectome was a project that had been going for, on for about eight years. And so what it is, it's an imaging project. It, it is a project that, that's, that is run at four institutions in the nation, so in Minnesota, the WashU, um, UCLA, and Harvard. And they're measuring, in this project, we measured a th what, 1,200 people. We did two hours of three Tesla brain imaging on them. And those brain images were designed to measure how the brain is connected. And I'm going to show you another slide that does a better job of talking about connectivity. But I, what, I think what you also might really be, what a lot of people I talk to are in interested in is, we spent two hours on imaging these participants, but we spent another six, to, six hours or more depending on their speed and their answers, but we characterized so many things about them. Yeah? Yeah, so we, by, I mean, we and our research team did one-fourth of those 1,200 people. So we did 300 of them. Each site did 300 people. So I had a team of about half a dozen people who worked with these people every day um, measuring the data. Good question. Yep. So I was the PI, the local site PI on the project, and my job was really to oversee and make sure the quality was happening. I and did um, even recruiting, going out into the community, um, trying to uh, cover the the appropriate diversity in the sample and the age span and gender and things like that. So, um, so in the data, the other data that we measure, I'm going to show you later. But it spanned everything from simple. It, it spanned um, it spanned psych psychometric data. Uh, about psychoses or even just psychological health through cognitive performance. We did blood testing. I actually insisted that the whole project make these people fast so that we could get fasting blood glucose and lipid measures. And um, um, height, weight, vision, hearing, walking speed, hearing, uh, all these things. Um, so this is a ginormous database that's available to this, another big piece of the Human Connectome Project is it is, was written for, for our few centers who have these important, very special scanners, because these were three Tesla, but they're also kind of special for this project. Um, we have to make this available to the whole world. So we have to put these data publicly available so that other scientists can now go into these data and look at uh, what's going on there. So I kind of just got, I, I mean, really, <laughs> how do I say this just to be uh, flat? Uh, emotioned about it. I, I, came par I became part of the Human Connectome Project, but of course I retained my interest in biochemistry. So that project ended a year ago, but while usually the grant cycle is you want to keep a project going. So when we did the reapplication, I insisted that we add chemistry to this round. So now they will measure this brain chemistry on the, on, on the two sites that do have seven Tesla scanners. So um, Minnesota, and Harvard have seven Tesla scanners and will do these measurements um, and will be measuring brain chemistry on, on these participants going forward. That's also a longitudinal study, so it will follow up the past people. It will do a better job of reaching across diversity and it will get the spectroscopy at two time points in about half of the sample. So um, this is just a little bit of, of a little bit of teaser. Though because I'm here in Missouri, I'm also running this whole protocol here in Missouri. We have one of these special three Tesla scanners, and we have a seven Tesla. So this whole project, I'm actually running an arm of it here, and I'm in charge of still in charge of quality and data fitting. So we're doing a lot with that. And then we um, to entice you a little bit. This is Brett Frolager's lab in the CNS core. And um, his group did this segmentation. So this is a picture of another brain slice this way, but it's a much better seven Tesla um, picture. It took eight and a half minutes to measure this image set. But what he's doing is you can see, if you look at the blue and red lines, he's actually outlining the cortical surface of the brain, but also the gray matter, white matter boundary. And there's a lot that you can measure about the brain. And so it's a really interesting algorithm that we run. And um, really interesting research is simply done on things like cortical thickness and brain volume shrinkage with work like that. So this um, I'll show you in a moment. But this is really what the connectome is about. Maybe I'll just let it go for a bit. So pause this. So um, 
what are we talking about when we talk about connectome? So this image is a picture of literally the nerve pathways in the brain. So I don't have time you know, here to tell you exactly how it works. You measure um, one image and then you do a manipulation that picks up where the nerve pathway, like it, 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 the, the imaging sequence is actually designed to pick up where water molecules are moving. And you do this several times in several ways. So eventually it gives you a way to, pick, to draw a picture of where the, neuron, the, the bigger neuron pathways are actually running in the brain. So this is one big piece of connectome. And that's actually why I say it's a special magnet. It actually has the gradients inside that can do this. It's a prisma. Um, and so it's really you have, to have a, you have to have those gradients to do this kind of connectome images. Then the other, though, there's a whole other piece. So the connectome also does structural, which I just showed you, because it is really um, a major field to just, one of the most robust measures of Alzheimer's disease still is to measure shrinkage of the hippocampus or even shrinkage of the cortical ribbon. So the, we do really good structural images in the project. Yeah? So is this like the, with like the brain bow? stuff like those like those scans as well or is this like a different technique i'm not sure I, I don't know what brain bow is okay because it's, it's something else uh you know dr sean for shaker is in the biology department okay he does a lot of uh like pathway analysis and stuff like most that. likely they, it is the same it's called, it's called brain bone the, the pictures look the exact same if you remember that uh, lecture from like three weeks ago um it's, I, yeah, it's called brain bone. So my best days. guess would be this. It, one of two things. You could probably do that with PET. They might be doing something with positron emission tomography scanning. But it is most likely MRI, and brain bow is most likely the name of the analysis package that takes the raw data and creates the pictures of the nerve pathways. Because there is controversy in science and um, technical development all over how you turn your data into this kind of a picture. Because you change how you do it, you'll change your picture. So probably Brainbow is the analysis package that, but yeah, and, and you know, these data, he could very well be pulling these data into his package. That's, I went to a conference this summer and it's like whole conferences full of people are using our data. But it's really, it's really actually fulfilling. I feel like, well, I did something worthwhile in my life. So, so that's one way they measure neuron pathways. Um, but another, there's another uh, way that we measure brain connectivity. So um, we do something called um, resting state, and actually what we call it's functional imaging. So it turns out that, that the amount of blood in an area influences the signal intensity in the image a little bit. So what we do is we tell people, we're going to take an image, lay still, try not to think about anything, try to rest. And then the next, for the, then for the next five minutes, we tell them, we're going to show you a bunch of faces. Um, and we want you to memorize the names that go with these faces. And then we give you a test. Push this button if you think this name is the right name for this person. So we give the, this is just one example of a task. Sometimes you give them a motor task, like tap your fingers like this. Um, sometimes you give them math to do, or reading, or something. But you give them a task. You subtract the working image from the resting image, and you actually get a very tiny signal difference. And that actually ends up showing you where the brain is lighting up, is where their brain is working on that task. And this has implications all over psychology, learning. Um, we use this, uh, they, they use it to map um, if someone has a tumor, should they, or a seizure, can they take certain areas of the brain? Is this person working on language in this particular area of their brain? We better not take it out when we try to treat their, their cancer or epilepsy. So um, that's where it's used. But then it turns out that over time when they were doing these experiments, what they found is that pretty much it made sense where the brain was activating for tasks. But there turned out to be a set of um, networks in the brain, a certain set of brain areas that actually the signal goes down. And at first they thought, well, that's just a nuisance. We're not thinking about it. But it happened so predominantly in all of the experiments that it's now known as what's called the resting state network. It's thought that when your brain needs to start working on something, it takes attention from somewhere else. And the resting state network then is thought to be maintaining memory. Like when you focus on something else, you have to divert your attention. But otherwise, the brain is always working on this basal function, which, you know, it's convenient, right, if you're interested in Alzheimer's disease to say that the resting state network is associated with memory. So what this image is going to show you is it's, it's, it's fun because the connectome made this. And it's, it, it, it's a pretty image. But what it's going to show you is it, this is a study of sound. So it's the arcuate fasciculus. 
and you're seeing here the nerve pathways for the arcuate fasciculus, but then you're going to see where the, when a person um, listens to music and not listens to music, you're going to see where their brain is working by um, some reddish colored signals, and it's really interesting, I think, how that overlays with um, the nerve pathways. So there you see appearing where are the, where's the brain working on sound? It's right at the end of the arcuate fasciculus um, nerve pathway system. Need another look or did you catch it? And if you want to see it again, <laughs> raise your hand. All right, so I also do, uh, I want to leave time for your questions, so that's why I keep looking at my Clark, sorry, if that seems rude. I'm not checking my email. So uh, this is kind of technical. This is one of the things that the project is doing. So this is the hippocampus. This is a slice of the brain this way. The hippocampus is a really complicated structure and really important for memory, kind of right inside. Of, if my fingers could extend into my brain, I'd be grabbing my hippocampus. It's got this really contorted shape to it. And at higher field with seven Tesla, where, and even with really, really good three Tesla imaging, you're able to actually not just see the hippocampus and get its volume, but get the subregions within the hippocampus because it's also parcelated into several functional units. This is no. just, oh, uh, yep. How are they, so like, I, work, I work on a hippocampal model. Uh -huh. how, like, how are they distinguishing the different regions of, because that's, like that's a hotly debated thing, and mm -hmm. like the limbic system and hippocampal and amygdala regions is actually saying, how you actually know you're in the CA1 section of the hippocampus or something like that. How are they, yeah. how are they distinguishing uh, regions here? Any idea? So what they're doing here is it's really, um, it's a, what do they base their algorithm on? So this is the segmentation. So this is not specifically my work. I haven't thought a little bit about that. They're really, it's more anatomical. So it's not, um, I, they would be looking for, Really how they train these things is they have experts like um, medical school students who need jobs for the summer. They have them literally go into the brain and they trace these areas. I think this looks like this region. Or psych psychology students, you, they trace it by hand. And then that is fed into a model that then gets trained to actually be able to draw these areas. So um, it very much has to do with signal differences. And I've, gl I've glanced over a whole world of how we change exactly how we make the measurement in order to enhance the boundaries between these regions. Does that, does that answer your question? Sure. So um, another advertisement, this is just a, a resting state um, network. And you can see how at 7 Tesla, you just get much better signal than at lower field. Um, so we haven't even begun to do the Connectome project at 7T, but we'd like to. Uh, they, there has been work in Minnesota on it. We just, it just isn't happening because there aren't enough 7Ts in the, in the world. But this is, um, I did tell you earlier that I would tell you, this is the ancillary data. So in addition to the two hours of scanning that we do with these participants, um, I mentioned these are the general categories. So we are still measuring, um, I can measure, for example, um, polygenic risk score for various diseases, including Alzheimer's disease. We're measuring their physical activity. I'm just trying to find things that we didn't um, talk about yet. TBI exposure is um, surveyed in the study. Um, menopause is a focus of the study. It's thought that women experience a cognitive deficit through the menopause period, and then um, some do and some don't recover from that, and also what's going on with men of the same age. Um, we would just maybe not thinking uh, it's harder for them to identify that transition. Um, vascular psychopathology, medications, we handedness, demographics. Um, we also collecting socioeconomic status was another focus and another attempt at trying to reach across diversity and actually a stronghold possibly that I'll be trying to work on at this institution. Um, for my next grant, I'm working with outreach here trying to figure out how we're going to get into the uh, um, uh, it's just a, it's a, it's a new um, import. I guess we're getting more and more support to do be a better job of reaching across diversity in our studies. So um, I don't know because you're neuroscientists. I just thought it, it's worth you know when we look at this behavior data, we measure sadness, fear, anger, <laughs> um, self-efficacy, perceived rejection, perceived hostility, loneliness 
Instrumental support is like, who do you have around you? Um, friendship, emotional support, positive affect, meaning and purpose. And so that's done at several. So another thing that, uh, this is the last thing I'll tell you about and then leave time for more questions. Um, when COVID hit us, we were in the middle of this study. So I was, was working with a team of about half a dozen people, highly trained people who, are, who their job is to see people come into the lab every day, right, and do these measurements and all of a sudden, boom, we can't do anything. We can't do anything like that. So I realized that, that my staff was highly trained in um, administering highly standardized cognitive tests. And so they, they understand how to measure these things I just told you about, all these uh, psychological impacts. And I thought, aha. So in, in um, stress research, it's really, really hard to do human stress research because you cannot ethically stress a human being on purpose. So you can't get the data before and after the stress. At best, you can measure uh, groups of people who are likely to experience stress and do, but here all of a sudden, we had a natural stress happen in the middle of our experiment where we were doing very, very good measures. So I quickly jumped on board and we developed a way to do these measures over the phone, gather um, information from these participants in Minnesota. I think the reason I was more in tune to this is because um, we had the very, uh, you know, Oh, it just was a, a, a horrible experience in our city with George Floyd being murdered by a police officer. And we had rioting, and it was just everybody was turned upside down about, like, how can this happen in our modern world? But it did happen, and this is what's... So we had, like, stress was just, like, over the roof and in Minnesota. And I even wonder if even just the Minnesota cohort, you know, um, will have possibly a greater uh, influence. So this data set, independent of all the imaging, I'm trying to, it, it, science-wise, it was like you might call, I don't know, it was a scramble, trying to get this all together really quickly. And so the data are not as cleanly organized as most studies, and it's a mess. And one of the things I want to actually do is get this data set housed here in Missouri um, so that we'll be here for students to work with, for the rest of the world to work with, before we forget what we did. Uh, but we can actually study the influence of stress on cognition, for example. So I think that's really something we hope to get to do. And I'll, I'll quit there. You're well, in, any questions? So how much of this, um, like all the stuff that come out, like with the uh, vitamin C analysis and all that kind of stuff, how much of that is like digital signal processing? And how much of that is do you guys have a fancy machine that has higher resolution and it's easier to figure out now? Or is it a combination of It's about those? half and half. And so my uh, half of my expertise is in the edited acquisition of the data. My, the rest of my publications are about how can we make sure we're properly, properly picking this signal out. Is it accurate? What influences it? So I would, and actually my, my students right now are learning to run the magnet and they're learning to process the data and manipulate both. How to get a better data set and how to process better. Gotcha. All right, you're good. <laughs> All good. I have a meeting that got 